Hey there, everybody. I think we are live, but let me double check on the actual Facebook. I know the one time that I don't check is the one time that things won't actually go live. So let's double check that we are here. And there is my smiling face. Awesome. So hey there, I'm Jason Logston, and this is Exploring Sous Vide. We're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. If you're joining us, say hi over in the comments. Let me know where you're from and what you've been cooking lately with sous vide. Today's sponsor is the ISVA Dessert Showcase. Join us for a free sous vide showcase on November 21st as we explore a delicious array of dessert applications. There's going to be eight talented chefs and home cooks presenting their favorite desserts. Everything from cheesecake to fruit pies and even alcoholic gummies and a sous vide layer cake. I'll be doing the gummies, one of the favorite things we do at parties. And Lisa Keys, I've seen her video of the layer cake and oh my it is uh, is worth showing up just for that. Have a few people joining us. We got uh, Darren Wilson uh, says, "Hey, Jody." Uh, we got Michael Shardy, my partner at the ISVA. We got Barb Logston, my mother, moderating the comments, trying to keep Mike and Kevin and Darren in line. Kevin is there. Says, "What's up, Huggy Bear? How's it going, Kevin? Good to see all of you." And yes, I have been waiting all day to say that, to Mike. And yes, Darren, I do need a haircut. It is uh, getting to be that time. You, even Jody thinks it's about time for that. And everyone can remember, you can join us live every Thursday when we record these episodes. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. Join us Thursdays at afmeasy.com slash show. Next week is going to be exciting. We have Chef David Petransic from PolyScience, fingers crossed, might be showing off one of his new pieces of equipment that is currently in the process of launching. Be one of the first looks available at it, and we're excited to have him on and take us through the paces. So you don't want to miss that. I think we're going to be doing it at a special time next week at 6.30. Prime time for Chef Petransic, as always. So join us, and I look forward to talking to you all then. So on to the show. Uh, all the, one of the great things about sous vide is exploring the different uses for it. It's what I love about it, that it can be used for more than just steak and pork and chicken. It has this wide range of applications, but many people are nervous about how to start and what it applies to. Luckily, today's guest is the perfect person to help us out. He's been cooking all of his life, but he took a short detour in the nuclear Navy after graduation. Upon leaving the military, he chose to pursue his dream of being a chef and enrolled in the top culinary school in the country, Johnson & Wales University, where he graduated at the top of his class. He rose through the ranks and went on to open and run several four-star kitchens in the U.S. and abroad. From there, he was recruited to run the test kitchens as a research and development chef of a large restaurant operation in Chicago. Six years later, he moved to Nashville to continue a career in R&D. Then last year, he decided to open an upscale diner in Taos, New Mexico. But uh, unfortunately, bad timing. He had to close the restaurant due to the pandemic. But he's currently freelancing as a private chef throughout the country and is looking forward to reopening a small restaurant in the next 12 months. Can't wait to learn from today's guest, Chef Johnny Gobbledon, founder of Sous Vide Dummies and the food blog BakersBiscuit.com. Chef, welcome to Exploring Sous Vide. Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. I can't wait to dive into all the really cool stuff that you've done. I loved, um, we do an intake form and people talk about what they sous vide and you had some of the most interesting things on there that I want to talk about. But before we get started, I always like to ask, what is it like around your dinner table on a typical day? Uh, well, I'm a single father. Um, and so I have, uh, I take great, great pleasure in, uh, serving a couple of young gourmands. Uh, they, uh, my two boys have been, uh, spoiled to have a, um, a chef as a father. And so we, uh, we rarely will eat leftovers. And quite honestly, I do a lot of, uh, experimenting. Uh, if I haven't tried it, um, I would love to try it, but, uh, you know, we, we, I just, uh, started in, in, um, uh, I bought a Komodo style grill. And so I've been doing a lot of, uh, a, a ton of, uh, experimenting with the Komodo grill. Uh, so, uh, 
I, I would say most recently we're probably doing uh, whatever I can do in the grill. I've been doing some some breads in there. Obviously, the long cooks, the short cooks, um, uh, just having fun. And do your do your kids generally like the experiments? Are they picky? Are they are they good t- tasters that they give you feedback, or do they just eat everything? Or but, you know, it's funny because my kids, um, my my older kid, um, the they're they're not very vocal about what you know when whether they like the food or not. I can tell you know within the first bite or two. Uh, because generally it starts with, mm, and that's, that's a good sign. So nice. I take that as a compliment nowadays. That's as much as I can get. So I'll take that. But it's quiet and you just find it in the, in the garbage four hours later, you know, that there was a, a failed experiment, <laughs> right? Right, right. We have a few people joining us here. Uh, Mike Lashardi says, Hey, Johnny. Hey, Mike. We got uh Rosemary Simpson says, Hey, Johnny. Rosemary. Welcome. Uh, Darren Wilson from Firewater Cooking says, here's Johnny. Hey there, Darren. <laughs> uh, a few different people joining us. Mike says his uh, his son has got pickier with age. Now he just rolls his eyes when um, <laughs> when Mike says he's cooking. He oh. needs some tips <laughs> on how to get him to eat the gourmet goodness. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I- I'm going to tell you, I have my younger son. He's got a textural problem, and I've never dealt with this. You know, when I was growing up, my parents made us eat what was on the table. And, and if you filled up your plate and you didn't like it, you still had to eat it. Yeah. So I come from that mentality, you know, and uh, I'll tell you that my younger son has this textural issue and he doesn't like soft foods. So that kind of throws me for a loop sometimes. He doesn't like, you know, things like avocado, mashed potatoes. He he doesn't like pie, it, oddly enough. He, they, it, I used to take him to Chinese restaurants in Chicago. And they would fight over the eyeballs (laughs) and he doesn't eat pie. So that's what I have to deal with. (laughs) That is, uh, yeah, most, most kids that I've heard of would choose pie over eyeballs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So diving into a little bit about sous vide. I know one of your favorite things is sous vide corn. A lot of people wouldn't think about that being someone's favorite um, thing to cook in sous vide. Tell, tell me a little bit about why you love corn and sous vide so much. I'll tell you the, the flavor of corn is, is just completely elevated. I, I, yeah, I think I had mentioned earlier that if I only had one thing that I could do with an emergent circulator, if it was sous vide corn, I would be more than happy to pay a couple hundred bucks for a device. Um, you know, the, just the whole idea of the corn cooking in its own juices and its own uh, steam, basically, uh, really simple. Um, it's uh, one of the few ingredients that I will now only cook uh, sous vide. I love that. What's your go to time and temperature for sous vide corn? Oh gosh, um, I'm. We put, we put people on the spot here on exploring sous vide. It's a, it's, it's also a quiz show. I did I not uh, uh, tell you that? I, see, I didn't study for that one. I I, I don't want to give you a bad temperature. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that it's up in the 185 one hour range, but don't quote me on that. Come to sous vide <laughs> dummies and uh, we got plenty of posts. <laughs> That's a good That's plug right. for for the for the group. I was going to say, so you run the sous vide dummies Facebook group. Talk, talk a little bit about the community that you're uh, you're building there. Uh, well, we we um, I started the group. Uh, gosh, it's it's been almost four years, three years. Uh, and we when we started the group, it was small. You know, the the, the I believe it was the Anova di- uh, device that had just come out. Uh, so a lot of us, and I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't have a lot of sous vide experience when I started the group. Uh, we, um, you know, the whole notion was to exchange ideas and to promote the, uh, the usage of the device and, you know, try to find out if it was worth our time. And so the community just grew really quickly. Um, you know, here's the funny thing. It it grew from the instant pot group because the instant pot had just come out with their device. So we had a lot of people uh, shifting over from the um, instant pot community. And, um, you know, over, the, over time, it's grown. Uh, you know, the, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. The name came from the notion uh, of a, another 
group that I was in sous vide trying to learn. And, you know, the notion was that, um, uh, that you couldn't be a great cook and use a sous vide device. <laughs> you were probably a dummy. <laughs> and so that's where the name came from. And it's, it's cut. There's some, some irony to it, but you know, the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, we have all levels of people in the group and, uh, just a lot of fun sharing, you know, beginner level experience and knowledge and uh, all the way up to, you know, some different experiments that people are, you know, happy to, you know, play with different types of food. Um, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good community. We, we, we've got some great people in there sharing recipes, sharing ideas, uh, giving people feedback. And um, it's... Uh, fortunately grown into some other splinter groups uh, of different devices and, you know, other, other groups that, you know, where we specifically talk about, um, or I shouldn't say specifically, but we talk about food in general. So it's not, you know, specific to uh, sous vide, but uh, a really good uh, broad community and uh, a lot of great ideas and a lot of great feedback in there. If uh, Chef James uh, Bruchione and Chef Thomas Keller are dummies, then I am happy to be a, a dummy as well for using sous vide. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I know one of the things that's also that you talked about splinter groups coming off of your Facebook group um, and combining it with sous vide is ice cream. You are a big fan of making ice cream and use sous vide for the process a lot. I think a lot of people don't picture sous vide and ice cream going together. They just picture a bag with melted ice cream in it. Can you talk right. a little bit about where it comes into the process? Right. And, and that's basically what it is. It's melted ice cream. Uh, you know, the whole idea, uh, geez, I, I think I um, experimented with ice cream bases uh, as one of the first things that I did beyond, you know, meats. Uh, uh, way back in the day. And so the idea, you know, the beauty of sous vide is that you have you have precise temperatures. Uh, and so, you know, one of the problems with ice cream uh, making is that when you're when you're working with the base, uh, the, and I'm, I'm not speaking for myself, but a lot of times uh, the base will overflow because you've, you know, taken your eye off of it because it, you know, it, it requires a lot of uh, attention uh, and and stirring, uh, but I've heard <laughs> that other people have problems with uh, <laughs> ice cream bases overflowing. It's never happened to me. <laughs> uh, I, I can but, see that. People ask why I like sous vide oatmeal, and I say because I don't have to clean up yeah. burnt oatmeal off of my stove. Because every time exactly. I get on the stove, I forget that it goes over that I have to scrape yeah. it off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's it's a no stir device, you know, for a lot of things like that. It's a no stir device and. Uh, it worked out beautifully when I tried it the first time. Um, you know, the, the other problem you have with, you know, the stirring is potentially the scorching. And, you know, since I've had, um, since I've been using uh, sous vide to do my ice cream bases, I don't, I, I've never had a problem with scorching. Nice. I'm always surprised by the convenience of sous vide. People picture yeah. it as this gourmet technique and you can do amazing things with it. But for me, mm -hmm. one of the, my favorites is just, a lot of it does become brainless, which is, it's great. That's what a lot of ki kitchen tools are going towards is the oven is a lot better than a wood fired, you know, outdoor campfire because you can control it a lot better. Right. And the be just takes it one more la layer. Yeah. Yeah. Fast, fun, and easily done. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we got uh, Lloyd from Kosher Dosher joining us as, hey, JJG. Lloyd. Hey, Lloyd. Lloyd is one of my uh, favorites there. We have... Uh, yeah, Lloyd's great. He uh, does some really cool stuff. He actually did a presentation on ice cream at our uh, sous vide summit um, oh. that we did virtually. Uh, he did a good job on that. Uh, we have Tiago joining us. He's been on the show. Uh, he says, hey, guys, are we talking about ice cream? Uh, he's excited. Ice cream. Ice cream Everybody man. shows up for ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's your, what's your go-to ice cream uh, flavor? I assume you're not just a pure vanilla guy if you're making it sous vide and experimenting so much. Oh man, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that it's the vanilla base is uh, nice. straightforward. Uh, you know, I, I'm a purist when it comes to ice cream. I, I have been playing with the notion of non-dairy based ice creams, v uh, basically vegan ice creams, um, and I've had some successes. 
um, and and that's kind of where I'm playing now. But uh, you know, for me, you know, straightforward ice cream is is where it's at. If you, if you do it right, it's perfect, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, David LaForce says we all scream for ice cream. Uh, a little yes, shout out to <laughs> a little shout out to David LaForce. He's helping us put together um, kind of being our content wrangler for building out our network of recipes for the ISVA. Oh, okay. So if, if anyone out there listening or or you, I know you have a blog that's uh, coming back, I believe. But uh, if anyone has sous vide recipes, but not they don't have a home for them, uh, get in touch with uh, David LaForce and he'll be happy to provide a home and get your recipes in front of a our, our amazing audience, which is all of you. So Tiago wants to know, do you have a corn ice cream recipe? I don't know if Tiago was even on earlier when we were talking about sous vide corn, but that's a great, uh, would have been a great segue for me to use. I'm going to tell you, I do actually have a corn ice cream recipe. Uh, corn is great in desserts and I've used it quite a bit. Now I'm from the Southwest. Uh, my roots are, you know, uh, Native American, part Native, Native American, and obviously some of the Hispanic side, but um, we use corn for everything. <laughs> you know, uh, corn pudding, um, uh, I've used whole corn kernels and, and broken them off into, um, into ice cream bases, and it's, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a great, little, uh, great little play on flavor. I could see that because corn does have such a like freshly, really ripe, fresh corn has such a good sweet flavor yeah. to it. I can imagine it would go really well with the the ice cream base. It does. It does. So the best thing to come after ice cream, of course, is finishing your meal off with coffee. Um, you do sous vide coffee as well. Is that correct? I do, and and you'll notice the trend here. Some of the things that I developed are uh, items that I find uh, uh, take. A long time to do so you know the the notion of cold brew coffee 24 hours uh i think a lot of chefs are driven by the idea of making things uh, better faster and easier and so i had to try you know uh the uh, uh basically a low temperature brewed coffee and uh, it works really well uh one of the things that i'm um playing with and i, I actually did this uh probably about two years ago with uh with a um, uh, pastry uh, siphon, um, a whipping container, and some uh, nitrous uh, uh, chargers, okay. uh, I made some um, uh, nitro coffee, and uh, that worked out really well. Um, I have a device now that I'm. Uh, I have um, the box uh, waiting to be opened, and uh, uh, I, I want to do. Um, a larger batch of uh, uh, nitro brew coffee. Uh, nice. So that's where I'm playing now. I mean, it's, you know, when, when you brew it at the lower temperature, you don't have to deal with the, um, uh, the, the acidic compounds, the, the, you know, one of the things uh, uh, as a chef, and I think a lot of chefs go to this, we, we, you know, at one point I was drinking so much coffee that my doctor said, Hey, look, you got to stop, you know, it's ju just eating your insides out. And so, the cold brew, the low temperature brew vid, uh, it works out great because I don't have to deal with that that really harsh acidic component and uh, tastes great. You get some good coffee and it tastes great. How low do you put your temperature generally when you're making your coffee roundabout? Uh, I I played with quite a few different temperatures. Uh, I found that 150 tends to work out really well for me. Cool. So it has like maximum flavor extraction without getting those the more acidic compounds. Right, right. I found as that, as that I as that I got up in in temperature as I, as the temperature started, uh, you know, once I went above one hundred and fifty, I I would start to see some of those um, some of those uh, acidic components that you know you're trying to avoid with uh, with cold brew, uh, but um, uh, you know on the on the lower end it was just too weak. Uh, I played with different grinds, um, and I found that one hundred and fifty was 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 a good number to, to, to stick to. And I, I think that's, that's kind of the standard now when, when I see people doing brew coffee coffees, uh, one fifties, right about, um, average. Yes. What's uh do you have a go-to coffee brand that you really like, or that you've been enjoying lately? 
Uh, I'm going to tell you that I've been roasting my own coffee. Uh, right. you, you know, of course, the, I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I'll tell you the 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 pandemic has been. Uh, I I don't want to use the wrong words, but it's been good in terms of uh, me taking on projects that I've been wanting to do for quite a while. I was say um, I, but, you lost your restaurant because of it, so you're allowed to look at the bright side as well. <laughs> exactly, uh, <laughs> I can do all this stuff now. You know, now that I have time, <laughs> yes. so I'll take it. I'll take it. You know, whatever I can get. So, what goes into the process of roasting coffee? I have a general idea, but I don't like. How do you? Where do you get the beans from? Do you are you growing a coffee tree as well? Bush? Oh, thing? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Uh, no, there's a huge market of green coffee beans out there. Uh, there's a, a, a website I think most beginning home roasters use, uh, Sweet Maria's. And uh, they. the good thing about their uh, business is that they will actually cup the coffees for you and tell you what exactly to expect, you know, once you roast these coffees. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a simple process. And they, they have tons of videos online. Um, they walk you through the process, you know, depending on, you know, what type of roaster you decide to, to use, how you want to roast it. Uh, and then, you know, obviously there are a lot of forums on, on Facebook that are great. Um, so, you know, and I'm just, I'm honestly just a beginner. I think the results with just the beginning, uh, um, you know, as a beginner, I think are far superior than 90% of the stuff that's on the, on the shelves right now, you know? Nice. Have you ever yeah. tried doing a just a sous, sous vide infusion with the with the green coffee beans unroasted at all? Uh, no, you know I've never. I, my understanding is that the green beans don't have a lot of flavor. Um, I've never tried that, but that's certain. I think we lost Johnny there. Um, he just disappeared. I think I am probably still alive. Um, if you are seeing me, let me know. He'll probably hop back in here in a second. Um, but uh, I definitely need to try his uh, nitrous uh, coffee. Uh, I've never done that before. I, uh, I have a book on whipping siphons and I have not done that. So I feel, I feel a little dirty that there's an entire technique for something that I love that I, I have not tried myself. If you're not familiar with the whipping siphons, they are a an excellent like impress the heck out of your friends device um, for parties and stuff. You can very easily make uh, quick foams and infused uh, creams and whipped cream and get it uh, in front of your friends and really impress them with a super low amounts of effort. Uh, one of my favorite things that I, I do with it is um, if you don't use nitrous, you can use carbon dioxide to carbonate things. And so you can, uh, when Mike does his uh, cherry Prosecco infusion, he recarbonates it in the whipping siphon. But you can carbonate any liquid, including the water in grapes or watermelon. So I do a carbonated watermelon salad with uh, you put watermelon in there or some lime juice and some jalapeno and a little bit of mint and you uh, let it sit with some carbon dioxide uh, pressured into it for about 24 hours. And then you have this fizzy salad with uh, sour and spicy. And uh, it's just an amazing, uh, amazing thing you can do with very, very little effort. So um, I'll let you know when Johnny comes back in. If you have any questions for me, let me know. I'll reiterate that we have the dessert showcase coming up. I think it's on November 21st is my understanding. But we have some amazing chefs that are and home cooks that are going to be there talking about it. Um, we're going to be doing the uh, Lisa Keys is doing a layer cake. I'm doing alcoholic gummies, which I got the idea from uh, Chef Steps. Uh, you make it sous vide and they come out like gummy worms or gummy bears, but they have um, alcohol in them. So it's great. I love doing an Amaro one. I've done a port one before, which was amazing. Uh, they're a great way to accidentally get your friends drunk um, at parties whenever parties happen again and if you don't drink you can also use any sort of strongly flavored liquid in them now that i don't have my my narrow view you can see my co-host uh over here the dog wandering behind me um needing head rubbies the entire time um he's very helpful co-host all the time so let's see um 
let me know if you have any questions. Um, if not, I'll keep killing some time till uh, Johnny jumps back in here. Um, I know this weekend I'm having uh, we're having a, a rager with uh, three friends coming over. Uh, it's supposed to be nice on Friday, so we can sit socially distanced in our backyard. But I'm gonna be doing a apple parsnip uh, soup with sous vide, which should be really good doing uh, sous vide pork loin, which I have in right now. I'm going to um, end up doing a cocoa crust on that. And then I'm going to be plating it with a persimmon um, chutney. And um, looks like Johnny, is, uh, Chef Johnny is back with us. I'm going to add him to the stream. And you are back, Chef. Hey, sorry about that. My phone Not a problem. got super hot and turned off on me. It's so the it's your fancy uh your fancy recording studio. It just you it know is. keeps all the heat in there. <laughs> and and I got it. I got the microphone working now, so I can actually hear you pretty good. So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> we'll finish up a few of the comments people have here. Kevin says he makes large quantities of carbonated fruit. I was talking about making carbonated watermelon in the whipping siphon. Uh, he makes large quantities of carbonated fruit by putting dry ice in the pressure cooker with the fruit and letting the ice sublimate and create pressure. I have not done that myself, but I've heard that it's a great way to do uh, large amounts of uh, fruit and liquid. And Lloyd, like everyone else on earth, knows that I do, in fact, need a haircut. Once hey, once the gotta... wings are sticking out the back, you know, it's <laughs> it's a little, uh, it's, you know. You got to can... do like me. I, I just do it myself. I you know, I get the little vacuum thing and, and <laughs> I've, I've thought about just doing that. Um, I might, might have to do that uh, tomorrow morning or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't have a very large audience, you know, I'm doing the social distancing, so I don't see a lot of people so. nice. <laughs> yeah. except when I do, you know, podcasts like this. <laughs> yeah. My wife liked the, uh, the, the, the floppy hair, but now that's just become long and unruly. She's a uh, less of a fan of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, you know, it's a pandemic. It's a, it's a, it's a sign of the times, you know? Yep. yep. I mean, and to be fair, even with the new haircut, I don't look that much better. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> I just look scruffy in different ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I wanted to talk eggs. Eggs are one of the few things I really still struggle with, with sous vide. Um, and you mentioned that you do froached eggs, which I had to look up because I have not heard of that. And now that's all I want to eat. Can you talk about what the, the froached eggs are? Yeah. Have you tried froached eggs? Or are you, no. are you still in? Yeah. What is your, let me ask you this. What is your problem uh, with sous vide eggs? I can never figure out the right time and temperature to accomplish what I'm trying, or it just gets stuck in the shell. And when I try to get it out of the shell, it just ends up being mangled anyway. Yeah. I'll tell you the best thing about sous vide eggs is the yolk. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, the, the, the idea behind the froached eggs uh, was uh, I was actually working at a hunting lodge uh, with a, um, the, the owner there who like, he, he likes uh, poached eggs, but, hardly any, any of his guests, the uh, hunters actually like poached eggs. And so I did these uh, sous vide eggs, uh, um, you know, my preferred temperature, 163 for is it 163 for 12 or 13 minutes. Hmm. Um, don't quote me on that. Come to the group. <laughs> that, that's uh, what I was thinking out. you were going to say when you said uh, <laughs> 163. I was like, I think that's like 12 to 13 minutes, right? And so yeah. Yeah. And, and so the problem I had uh, was the white being too runny, you know, mm -hmm. and so uh, as a lot of uh, great dishes were invented back in the day, they were they were made on the fly. Uh, you know, I had a dozen uh, sous vide eggs and uh, a lot of people that didn't want them. Uh, and so I said, well, well, you know, let's try to crisp these up on the outside. And that's basically what it is. It's a uh, it's um, a cross between a you know poached egg and uh, a fried egg. Uh, and so I I presented this to the group a couple of years ago, and I said, hey, what should we call these? I was leaning towards fried eggs. Um, <laughs> that didn't win. So the group said, let's do froached. And I was actually calling them fried at the time, but I said. Uh, uh, the group was, was leaning towards Froach. And I said, let's do Froach. Uh, from there, we had a lot of people experimenting with, you know, things like, like uh, breadcrumb, uh, cheese, 
you know, an outer, outer layer of cheese. But the beauty of a froached egg is that you take, you know, the, the sous vide egg, uh, let it chill, uh, and then you fry the outside. So you've got the best of both worlds. You've got the crispy white, and then you've got the silky, beautiful custardy uh, egg yolk all in one. <laughs> Sounds amazing. I, I need to try that sometime. It just sounds sounds like something I would really, really like. <laughs> it's really good. You know, another one of those ideas that, you know, if the emergent circulator only did one thing, I would be more than happy if it if if I could just do sous vide eggs and and fry them froached. <laughs> do you ever do uh, scrambled eggs at all? Yes. Absolutely. Love sous vide scrambled eggs. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, the, the, it takes a lot of the, the technical aspects of, you know, making a classic French scrambled egg where, you know, you, you it, it, low temperatures, you're stirring a lot, you know, and, and you get this beautiful custardy, great dish, you know, and with sous vide, you pop it in a bag, put it in, you know, a specific temperature and it comes out and man, you can't beat it. <laughs> I love that, that type of the concept of taking things that take a lot of time and energy and technique and making it super yeah. simple. And I'm a big fan of like learning how to do things a traditional way. Like I've, you know, I think a good example is I made, I make fresh pasta every once in a while. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to make it, I'm going to roll it out with like the rolling pin and do all this. And I did it and it was really fun. And I was like, and from now on, I'm using like the rolling attachment on my my mixer because it saves so much time and energy. But like, I did it once. That's yeah. great. I know how it works. I'm going to do the easy yeah. way now. Yeah. Hey, Jason, you got to join my pasta group too. <laughs> oh, nice. You have a lot of different groups. What other what other groups do you have? Uh, well, there's the pasta group. Uh, we have uh, a chef's knife group. It's basically a culinary knife group. Uh, that's a lot of fun. That one's grown. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. A lot of these groups I created so that I could learn and I'm learning mm -hmm. quite a bit from them. Uh, you know, there's all, there's always somebody that knows, uh, has more knowledge than you. And so I'm, you know, really happy to, to learn from people like that. Um, we have a baking group. We have a, a smoking group. Um, I have a local group, uh, a New Mexico cooking group. Uh, which is uh, interesting because that one brings back a lot of memories of, you know, some of the more uh, down home, home rural type of uh, New Mexican cooking and, you know, some of the, the Pueblo style cooking here. Um, what's a, what's gosh. a, what's a like Pueblo style dish that you think everyone should know about? Well, I'll tell you the, that most uh, Mexican and New Mexican and South American dishes were developed by the Native American uh, indigenous people. Um, and so when you get into Northern New Mexico and New Mexico in general, you have, you know, the eight Northern Pueblos, uh, very traditional cooking. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's just night and day what they're doing. The dishes aren't so distinctly different, you know, the, New, Central New Mexico, we have a lot of, um, it's one of the few places where you have a lot of natural blue corn that's popular. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see like some, some blue corn bre uh, breads that are made with blue corn. Um, but, uh, you know, one of my favorites here, the, the, there's a, a Pueblo, they're changing their name since I've been back, but they were known as the Santo Domingo Pueblo. Uh, they make the best blue corn uh, tamales with, uh, New Mexico. Well, it's their, the chilies that they grow on the Pueblo that are pretty distinct, uh, from, you know, that what they call people know as hatch chilies. Uh, but you can't, you can't beat a meal like that. You know, you, they sell it on the side of the road. They have, you know, gas stations as you're driving past the Pueblo and you stop and, you know, pick up some of these, what people would term street food, uh, it's, it's amazing, you know. That's awesome. And you've traveled a lot around, uh, around the country, uh, you know, exploring restaurants and different cuisines. What's a cuisine that you're really excited to dive into and learn more about? Oh, gosh. Um, I went on 
I went on a pizza tour and actually uh, went around the country to taste different styles of pizza. Uh, I also went on a barbecue tour. Um, nice. Yeah. And so I'll tell you, there's some amazing food in this country. I'd probably say uh, pizza and, and uh, barbecue, you know, the different styles of barbecue, the different styles of pizza. So let's get let's get everyone furious with you. What what state has the best pizza and what state has the best barbecue? Oh, you're gonna put me on the spot. <laughs> I, I'm gonna tell you where I've had the best pizza anywhere, bar none. Uh, and I'll, I'll start on the on the East Coast uh, with New York style style uh, charcoal uh, charcoal oven pizza. Um, I've, I've had uh, pizza at, uh, uh, oh, the guy in Arizona, uh, pizza, um, gosh, his name escapes me, but he does a, a pistachio pizza. Um, and he was one, he's credited with, with being, uh, gosh, the name Christopher comes to mind, but it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bother me all day. <laughs> uh, but he was credited with bringing uh, Neapolitan style pizza to America. Um, and you go to his restaurant in, I, I believe it's in Scottsdale, maybe in Phoenix, but it's a three hour wait, totally worth it. Um, and, uh, Barnum, the best crust I've had was in California with, uh, Nancy Silverton's, um, it's a Nancy Silverton and, uh, oh, the TV guy, um, Batol, uh, Mario Batoli's, uh, hmm. their, their pizza joint. Um, but, uh, she, the, the crust, and I've duplicated the crust that she has online. Uh, but as best as I can give you an answer, every pizza is distinct everywhere you go. And it's amazing all across the country. Uh, <laughs> I'm not big on Chicago style pizza. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I lived there for six years. Uh, but if I had, you know, to be limited to any type of pizza, it would be a, a Neapolitan style. Nice. Um, and, uh, if I can get a charcoal crust, uh, I'll work towards that. Um, I like the, uh, I like the Chicago style more than the New York style, but I live in Brooklyn. So all I, all I am ever allowed to uh, eat is New uh, York style. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I can see, you know, kind of getting a little tired of, you know, one specific style of pizza. Yeah, but, uh, I think it'd be better having a variety and then I want to, uh, you could have whichever one you're interested in where in New York, right. it's like, no, it's all New York style. Yeah, yeah. Well, and see, the, and, and the problem with New York style is that you can't get it just about anywhere else in the country yeah. made properly, made like, you know, New York, like they do it in New York. Um, so I can see that. You know, uh, Mike, far, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, as far as barbecue, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Memphis barbecue. Mm, nice. <laughs> Mike says, was it the uh, pizzeria uh, Bianco in Arizona? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mike to the rescue. I ate there, I think, when we were in Arizona for March Madness a few years ago. What did you think? Very, very good. Very good. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing stuff. And Darren, uh, to your point of, of what pizza is good, Darren's answer to what's the best barbecue is all barbecue is good. <laughs> period. Yeah, I wouldn't dispute that. <laughs> it's hard to beat it. Um, Mike's giving a shout out to Joe Benny's in Baltimore. He says the best Sicilian style pizza in the country. I know he's a big fan of Joe Benny's and Brilliant. keeps promising to take me there and then inventing excuses like global pandemics on why we can't go. I just don't understand. Come on, Mike. You got to pony up, man. <laughs> and Tiago is now upset. Um, he is. He lives in Texas. So Look, um, <laughs> Texas, they, they do some amazing brisket. But if you've never had Memphis barbecue, go home. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I, that's one of the things I really love is like about the pizza and the barbecue debate that it is like it's comparing apples to oranges in a lot of cases that like Chicago style pizza is almost a different dish than New York pizza. It's Absolutely. like what do you prefer scrambled eggs or a quiche? Like they're, they, you Absolutely. have the same ingredients, but they're not the same yeah. dish at all. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you mentioned that you worked, um, you do freelance work at a hunting lodge. What type of hunting and game do they have there? Uh, well, I live about two, maybe two and a half hours from the Colorado border. So uh, Santa Fe uh, basically comes down uh, at the bottom of the Rockies. Uh, we've got everything. We've got elk is a big one. You know, at this time of year, elk is the big one. Um, uh, we have a uh, bear. You don't see wild boar up here. Uh, uh, deer. Uh, you can go down south. There's a lot of like really interesting um, uh, fowl. Is that the right term? Um, um, we have the New Mexico is one of the few places in the world that you can hunt. Um, gosh, oh, um, it's the it's the it's an African animal. It's got big, long, straight horns. Oh um, yeah, kind um, of. It's black and white. It's a it's a it's it looks like a. Gosh. These, this is what I happens can picture when you it. get old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, and I want to say it starts with an A, but that's beside the point. Anyways, um, just about anything you can think of up in the mountains. Elk is the big one, and that's pretty much um, where I go to. It's, it's, you know, the thing is, like, people will come from all over the country and all over the world uh, to hunt in New Mexico. Um, and so there's quite, there are quite a few, um, hunting lodges up north, uh, in New Mexico, up towards the Colorado border. We have some guesses in the side. We have Oryx and Ibis. Oryx. 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 Yes. Uh, take that oh, Darren. Man. Mike I, wins. I, I wish I could see the, uh, I wish I could see the, um, the comments here. <laughs> or I think you spelled Oryx wrong, but you but it's Oryx. <laughs> e even in victory, Mike can still snatch the jaws of defeat. <laughs> I need to have uh, so, him on the on the direct line. <laughs> yeah. No, no one needs Mike on a direct line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what have you found that sous vide makes a, a bigger difference for some of those than other ones? Uh in in terms of uh wild game versus farm raised animal yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent um the you know the big issue with a lot of wild game uh is toughness and leanness so you're dealing with animals that you know i guess the bet that the best comparison could be grass-fed uh cow mm -hmm. um and so when you're dealing with lean meats uh, what a lot of people tend to do is overcook them, you know, with traditional methods, trying to get um, uh, the the the, the uh, texture uh, right. Um, but um, you know, obviously, with uh, sous vide cooking, uh, it, you know, you couldn't have a better method uh, for a lot of uh, game meats. That makes a lot of sense. I know. Uh... Uh, Chef Justice Stewart does a ton of different game meats and wild game and talks about how big of a difference it makes, especially for like elk and some of those that when you overcook yeah. them just a bit, they get, they just turn tough right away. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that you had mentioned to me was that you do um, uh, molecular cheese sauces. Is that using like sodium citrate or are you doing something else? Yeah, no, that's exactly what it is. I, ha I couldn't think of anything else. I'm like, well, I can't, you know, just call it cheese sauce. I'm mm -hmm. Call it molecular cheese sauce. But yeah. I'll tell you that, you know, again, an easy no-stir process. You're not dealing with uh, boil over. You're not dealing with scalding cheese sauces. Uh, throw all the ingredients in the bag. You know, I have a base recipe. You can, you know, mix up uh, different types of cheeses. And uh, you're done in, in less than an hour, you know. It, it pains me to admit this, but I've never done the cheese sauce sous vide. I've, I write about sous vide and I write about modernist cooking and I, I have made those cheese sauces all the time and I have never thought to use sous vide for it. I feel, yeah. I feel a little dirty inside. <laughs> it's easy, easy. Yeah. You know, once you do it, you'll never go back. And, th and that's what like a lot of, you know, sous vide cooking is. Once you do something, once you try something, yeah, you, you're not going to go back because it's so easy. 
I love exploring that in sous vide too. That there's things like like the cheese sauce that like for me, I don't know why it never crossed my mind. But as soon as you mentioned that, I was like, why have I not done that? That would be perfect. Like that's yeah. especially I, I use it for parties. Like it could be in the sous vide machine in like four bags. And when someone comes, I could pour out yep. a new bag and then the others are going to be hot and they're not going to yeah. congeal and collab, you know, con yeah. con you know, congeal. <laughs> we'll stick with congeal. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, cheese mixture to go into your cheese sauce? Uh, you know, I, I love sharp white cheddars. So anything aged white, um, I guess it can be yellow, but I typically don't find, you know, nice aged yellow cheeses. Um, one of the tricks I do is I'll throw in some Greek yogurt to give it a little bit of uh, tartness. Uh, and my recipe is a cross between... Um, Gosh, I don't even know why I bring up names because I'm forgetting everything. <laughs> um, uh, Sirius Eats. Uh, the, his recipe, uh, he used uh, condensed, he uses condensed milk. Um, and then I used the, the, the uh, citrate um, and sodium uh, yeah, so, sodium citrate and, and um, you know, a certain amount of uh, cheese. Uh, you know, I've even gotten to the point where I don't weigh the, the sodium citrate. Uh, I just measure it in a, in a teaspoon, tablespoon, and, and um, uh, you know, that's my base. And then from there, you know, I'm, I'm tossing in things like, um, you know, blue cheeses, um, breeze. My, you know, my older son loves breeze for some reason, brie for some reason. Uh, and, and, you know, I've made, cheeses with with uh or cheese sauces with just about everything yeah, i love the, the the sauces are so versatile too that when they're that runny hits i made some yeah. uh some cheddar beer soup um doing that um yeah. a month ago and then used some of the leftovers for you know a dip for chips and then the remaining leftovers to top a, nice. a baked potato it was just like kept going and going cheese cheesy goodness for a whole week it was awesome nice and the only problem with that is you didn't invite me <laughs> i know right <laughs> i apologize next time you'll have the invite to come over for uh thank you for leftover cheese dip <laughs> excellent excellent I don't get it. You know, one of the downsides to being a chef is people don't like to cook for you. Yeah. Yeah. I get that a lot too. People would be like, I mean, I'm not a chef, but people know that I have cookbooks out and stuff. Yeah. And they'd be like, I'm yeah. nervous to cook for you. Like I, yeah, I kind of don't exactly. want to. I'm like, I'm not picky. Like, especially if right? you if you put time and energy into something, I'm going to enjoy it and appreciate what you put in front of me. Cause that's, that's what it's about is. Amen. It sounds like a cliche, but it's like the heart of the food. It's not the the flavor when right. someone's cooking for someone. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, somebody else cooks for me and I'm not picky at all. Just, yep. I appreciate the fact that somebody's put energy into it and uh, they care enough to invite me. And I, I have one friend that will invite me over specifically for, for uh, meals and he's not intimidated by me. And I absolutely love uh, the fact that he's uh, brave enough to, to invite me over and, and have a meal. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And Pete, everyone time. cooks differently. Like it's yeah. If you stick to foods that you know and you like cook, like there's a lot of people that cook a lot better than I do that don't have any cookbooks out and are, don't work in restaurant yeah. kitchens, but they they know what they do and probably because their mom or their grandma taught them and it's amazing food. Exactly. Exactly. Then if I can go home and replicate it with sous vide uh, more conveniently, then I, I don't need to tell them that later. <laughs> yes. Yes. <clears throat> you had also mentioned, um, I think this is the last thing we're going to bring up. If anyone has any questions for the chef, please drop them in the comments while we talk about this next item. I'll be sure to get your questions in, but you're talking about doing some juicy Lucy's a variation on that. Can you talk a little bit? Um, it's a big, a big, uh, crowd favorite for the ISVA uh, chef Eric Villagas did a demo of juicy Lucy's at the, the ISVA summit where he put some together and I'd love to hear your process cause they were such a hit. So similar process, except that I'm shaping the juicy Lucy into a sausage shape. So it's more nice. of a hot dog and it fits into a hot dog bun. Nice. And uh, I'm coining the term now, uh, juicy Johnny's. 
and it, it may not stick, but I kind of like it, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's the same, same idea, uh, just a different shape, a uh, different bun. You know, I, I like the idea of trying uh, something, um, you know, for, for me, when I eat a hamburger, by the time I'm, I'm getting to the end, uh, it's just a different uh, experience. I don't know if that's a, the right term, but, um, you know, I'm thinking, you, you know, food is very subjective. Uh, you know, the way people eat, um, uh, the textures in your mouth, uh, temperatures by the end of the, by the time you're done or getting close to something, I think, you know, uh, the temperatures, um, the temperature from start to finish uh, can change the, the eating experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have this theory that, you know, maybe it might be a little bit more pleasurable. I, I don't know, but um, hey, I, I like to play with stuff and you know, let's try it. Let's try it out and see what happens. But, you know, the, the other idea is using different cheeses. I'm sorry to interrupt, but, uh, you know, possibly different different um, types of uh, filling. I'm, uh, I've got a batch of uh, kimchi working now. So uh, what's to say that I don't stuff it with uh, some kimchi and some, uh, I don't know, some gruyere or something like that, you know? Uh, I feel like one of the big issues with a Juicy Lucy, too, is that you have like the outside of the, the, the patty. And then when you finally bite in the middle, you get the big burst of cheese flavor. Yeah. And then it's like a lot less cheese in the rest. But if it's in a, in the tube, then you can, uh, you'd have that cheese throughout the entire process. Exactly. I had, I had a juicy Lucy that, uh, literally, uh, the cheese had melted out. So by the time I was into maybe the third or fourth bite, it was an empty pocket. <laughs> yeah. It, like literally had a hole in the middle. And uh, so, you know, maybe some, maybe a different shape would, uh, would alleviate, you know, a, a, an issue like that. So Mike has a question. He's, uh, he, I know him as the guy that will stuff anything into a hamburger. He loves oh. making like piccata burgers and lasagna burgers and tons of stuff. So he wants to know, how do you form, what's, what have you found to be an effective way to form your Juicy Johnny's? So, so what you do is take the cheese, make sure it's cold. It might even have to be uh, partially frozen and then form that into a tube by hand, uh, flatten out the, the, um, the ground beef on top of a plastic wrap mm -hmm. and then uh, roll it up and then take your plastic wrap like a candy wrapper and just twist it until you get a nice round shape. That is simple and sounds like it would be super effective. <laughs> so, yeah. Sounds like you've yeah. been working at this. <laughs> I've been I've been thinking about it. <laughs> I, I think about food a lot, so <laughs> you may not be able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not at all. Like it sounds like you you know just cook one or two things and that's about it. No experimenting, nothing. <laughs> right, right. Well, Chef, I appreciate you coming on, sharing all your expertise and your knowledge and the the really amazing things that you do. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, you inviting me. Uh, as I said before, I'm flattered that you uh, thought of me and, uh, you know, certainly invite you and everybody else here to, to join uh, the groups. We have a lot of fun talking about food and, uh, you know, share, sharing ideas. And uh, this was a lot of fun. And thanks for putting up with my uh, technical difficulties. Not a problem at all. And so if people want to join your group, it's the sous vide for dummies group, correct? On Facebook? Uh, so, uh, yes. So it's sous vide dummies. Uh, I don't use the four word because I don't want to get sued, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but sous vide dummies. Uh, and then the, the website, hopefully it'll be up and running the next couple of days, uh, www.bakersbiscuit.com. And I've got a few sous vide experiments on there. Uh, I do want to work on, um, on a meat series, you know, to help people, you know, understand what, how to choose me and uh, you know, what best methods are. So that'll be coming up in the pipeline, but um, there's, there are quite a few uh, sous vide articles in uh, on the blog. Nice. And maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll be able to talk you into uh, doing a demo at one of our upcoming sous vide showcases to uh, sh showcase some of your, your knowledge. Oh, that would be fun. Absolutely. Well, Chef, uh, thank you again for coming on. Thank you for everyone in the comments, uh, interacting, asking questions. Make sure to ch check out uh, Sous Vide Dummies and all of the Chef's other amazing projects out there. 
Um, this has been Exploring Sous Vide, all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. And remember, you can join us live every Thursday when we record these episodes. Next week, we're going to have a special unveil unveiling episode with Chef David Petransic from PolyScience as he shows off their new sous vide machine. I'm looking forward to that. There'll be an exclusive look at it. And you can ask questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and of course, see our smiling faces and see how long my hair is at that point. So join us Thursdays at afmeasy.com slash show. Until next time, I'm Jason Logston. See you all next Thursday. Thanks a lot, Jason. <laughs>